Hello and welcome to another episode of Tepe Republic. On the last episode we saw Takeyuki destroying the Hiroshima army west of Harima, wiping them out with ease, meaning that he had an opportunity to move west and attack a new province. However, Harima was then invaded by the Satsuma yet again. They landed more troops and I was forced to pull back into a defensive position. Meanwhile, Takahisa teamed up with Kunimitsu to push against the Yonago, destroying some Swano forces on the way and relatively easily capturing us a new castle, forming a new defensive position. Back over in Masashi, Tananao had laid siege to the heavily garrisoned castle and Kodama is moving up to back him up. A fight still hasn't happened to decide what's going on in that province. But in the nearby province of Izu, Yoshiyuji is wiping out some Odawara forces, capturing us a nice valuable area with a gold mine, leaving the Odawara with just a single province of Sagami left to take. Meanwhile, back up north, Takamichi, who hasn't been in on the action very recently, finally moved out of Echigo and starts moving south towards Kosuke to attack some other Edo forces. Then the Satsuma navy that dropped the forces off in Harima decided to come and attack my raiding force. This has happened many times before with other navies and the same fate befalled them. They were completely wiped out by the crossing the T formation, their ships burning and sinking to the bottom of the sea. But then a rebellion was stirred up by the Satsuma in Iga province, a huge rebellion which is now attacking the castle and we're going to attempt to hold them off. Who can seriously believe the lies of the revolution? What has changed, really? Why is it that the Todo family and their close friends control the military so tightly? The same military that maintains a presence in every major town of this domain, suppressing any notion that something is wrong? Why are foreigners buying up our industries? Why are wages dropping even faster than the quality of our housing? Why do the newspapers spout lies about the horrors of life in the old times, as if we had forgotten how good it was just a few years ago? So many questions, but all have the same answer. The Republic of Sioux is a sham, a desperate grab for power by the Todo family, callously shunning the divine rule of the Emperor and the historic institution of the Shogunate, not for any good reason, but only to create their own personal nation, where their rules replace those of nature. Outside of Sioux, everyone knows this and fights desperately to prevent the same fate befalling them. But here in the heart of it all, it seems our minds have been so twisted and corrupted by the Todo agenda that we are blinded to the truth, shaming a thousand years of our ancestors by stamping out their traditions without thought. So now, knowing all this, proud men such as I must seek to redeem themselves for their mistakes. And funnily enough, the best way to do it is through the method the Sioux so often wish to claim for themselves. Rebellion, revolution, an uprising of oppressed people who value their honour and their countrymen above all else. Like a mighty fire, this revolution will spread across all of Sioux, casting away the shadows of the Sioux lies, giving us the chance to finally make our own decisions. There can be no other cause as important as this. Who will join me? A storm rages in Iga province as the forces of the Sioux defenders prepare themselves to receive the rebels, currently advancing on the castle from all sides. They've split their force up into various small groups. Some of them are just spear levy like we can see here. They also have groups of cavalry like this one, which was charging right at the southern castle wall from the onset of the battle. I thought they were going to commit these cavalry who include their general to go right into the attack. But you can see they decided to turn back just before coming into range of the defenders, deciding that's actually a bad idea idea. You can see the defenders are matchlock militants for the most part here on the south side, not really the ideal soldiers, especially in these dreadful conditions which very much favour the enemy forces. The rain will damage the ability of those matchlock militants and our other firearms troops, so that when the enemy do come into range, as you can see here, I fire off a couple of volleys but pretty much doesn't do anything. Their accuracy is low and it's going to take them a long time to reload, so these guys are going to find it quite easy to get all the way up to the castle walls without taking too many casualties from gunfire from the guys up on the walls themselves. So that's going to play to the enemy's advantage. The question is what will happen once they get inside. Now I also noticed the enemy were advancing from the north and you can see on the map it didn't look like they were sending that many troops from the north at first, just a couple of regiments. But it turns out they actually had loads of regiments here that had been advancing under tree cover the entire time. 
So actually, once they got close, there were something like four or five regiments coming at me, and I only had a limited number of forces positioned on the north part of the castle to defend against them. This was slightly inconvenient, especially because those forces are mostly levy infantry who are so inaccurate, they weren't able to really hit any of the enemies as they came into view, so I started to rearrange my formation to put more men on the north side seeing this. Meanwhile, on the southeast part of the castle, on the east wing, the enemy are storming in with all those spear levy that my matchlock militants couldn't kill. Similar thing happening on the north side, the enemy easily reached the wall and begin their climb and bringing up these matchlock militants to support my levies so once the enemy break through the matchlock militants should cut them down. Meanwhile on the east wing all of those guys have managed to get pretty far inside the castle but now that they're getting closer to the walls you can see I've done a similar strategy to what I've done in the past, putting levy infantry outside the wall to gun the enemy down at close range so the enemy there are now taking extreme casualties. Meanwhile, on the north face, the enemy are taking losses from the climb and from the guys on top shooting them down, and in fact some of them have broken before they even reach the top of the wall, meaning they'll be slaughtered as they come over the parapets into my troops. Still though, there's plenty of more enemy troops coming up behind them, there's enough of them that the majority will reach without routing, so some combat is going to happen, and because these guys are spear levy and most of the guys defending are just levy infantry or matchlock militants, this fight will be in their favour, the spear levy are superior in melee, although not actually that much superior, both sides are pretty poor in melee overall. Seeing as I responded by sending in these Naginata levy, these guys are really similar to the spear levy, slightly higher defense, lower attack, and should be able to hold off the enemy, especially because morale is on our side here. On the west wing of the castle, the enemy did send in a few forces, but the action wasn't really happening on the west wing. The limited amount of men they sent in were guns down once they got sufficiently far into the castle, so the west wing was safe pretty much the entire time. Now back on the south, the enemy have resumed that cavalry charge they started earlier, bringing their horsemen and their general to come up to the wall, dismount, and begin to climb up to engage with my forces. Now those guys, the Yari Ki, are actually going to be pretty good in melee, so that's potentially a threat. The east wing doesn't look so threatening. The enemy are alternating between charging at the wall and running away, and they're being cut down. You can hear there's some really loud impact noises. It sounds like cannons are hitting these guys. It's actually the gunner attendants on the wall, a unit using some high-caliber wide-bore muskets that uh, fire extremely large shots, and the game treats them as cannonballs for some reason. Now back on the south wall, the enemy's Yariki are just about to make it inside. They could do a lot of damage, but look at this. Tons of them are gunned down and fall from the wall at the very last minute, killing a whole bunch of them and ruining their morale. There's still a fair number coming over, so it still could be a dangerous situation, but the situation is turning much more in our favor, as you can see from the balance bar in general. So there's not much hope of the enemy taking the castle. All I need to do now is limit my losses. I've got loads of forces inside, including my own Yariki, ready to receive the enemy in melee. But almost all the enemy Yadiki route before they finish their climb, meaning they're just coming over to be slaughtered. The enemy still has lots of spear levy left, especially guys who routed near the beginning and have now come back from routing to rejoin the fight, plus some undeployed Yadiki. But shortly after this, they decided to all route the Yadiki routing without taking any casualties at all, as it became clear that taking this castle was going to be absolutely impossible for them. As the defenders, we took almost no losses holding them off. It looked like it could have been a bit dangerous in a couple of moments throughout the battle, but overall our powerful garrison was easily enough to hold off this giant rebel army, and the rebel armies aren't really going to get any bigger than this, so there's not much the Imperial forces can do if they do wish to try and incite a people's uprising in Eager. Although I am relieved that the loyal forces emerge victorious, the whole affair has me quite down. Before this all started, Takeyuki had often boasted that Iga was impenetrable, that an invading army would be cast back by the strength of our people and terrain just like many warlords throughout history. But there have been no grand battles for our homeland, only inglorious massacres of people seduced by false ideals and the Emperor's gold. Takeyuki is my oldest friend and has my support until the end, be it bitter or sweet, but I don't think he really sees what his own people are going through. So minimal losses to defeat pretty much the entire rebel army and of course losses inflicted here at Eager don't really matter. These guys aren't likely to see battle again anytime soon so I can easily reinforce any losses and get them back to full strength unless the enemies incite another rebellion in this turn which seems unlikely. 
So there's plenty of bad news to deal with after that rebellion. The main situation, as you might remember from the last episode, here in Harima, the Irokuni have landed an army in Harima, which joins the Satsuma army, which already landed and is now heading east towards Setsu. So we've now got three full stacks in this area, and Takeyuki is going to have to work together with the forces in Setsu to try and take them down without letting them achieve any of their objectives, which I assume at this point is to get to Yamashiro, because that's what the last Satsuma army was trying to do. I assume that at least the Satsuma army here is doing the same thing and perhaps even the Iwakumi one as well because it is facing the same direction. The main decision to make here for me is whether to leave Takeyuki where he is to try and ambush the Hiroshima as they move east or to just attack them and then move Takeyuki east to perhaps take part in any combat with the Satsuma or the Iwakumi which is probably going to be in Setsu. I decided to put, just put making that decision off for a bit because I wasn't sure what to do first. I wanted to resolve other situations this turn. First I'm going to wipe out these rifle attendants which are standing around in my territory. And conveniently, we've also killed an enemy Ishin Ishi who was embedded in those troops. We've probably also saved these cotton weaving sheds from being attacked by the enemy, which is excellent news as well. Now the situation here you might remember was that I've just taken Tango with Takahisa's army with Kunimitsu in support. The general plan is for Takahisa to remain in Tango and just defend it against any enemies coming from the west, whilst his partner Kunimitsu is going to move off to potentially attack Tajima from the south. I was seeing whether I could get rid of any of these agents here. You can see the province is swarmed with enemy agents. I decided not to risk it or spend the money because it didn't look like it was going to be particularly successful. You can see the Yonago do have this force hanging around. I was worried that force might attack Tamba, which is another reason to bring Kunimitsu slightly south or be in a better position to attack them or come even further south and support the situation down near Takeyuki and generally in Harima. So Kunimitsu seems like the uh, prime candidate to send down to help out there. We especially don't need two armies is guarding Tango because it's not a particularly valuable area and it's very likely we're going to move on from there and perhaps defend another location such as Tajima once it's taken. Now way back over in the east we're moving Takamichi down from Echigo. We started this in the last episode and we're going to keep moving on. The goal is Kosuke, a not particularly valuable province but it's now just one turn away so I'm going to hide Takamichi's forces just beside the road. Next turn he can go and take Kosuke. That'll be another blow to the Edo forces and of course they have nothing to defend it which isn't the case in Masashi where they have a full stack defending the province. I have two stacks uh, continuing the siege. It's still not a situation where an assault would be advantageous. I would take heavy losses assaulting this citadel the enemy has some very decent troops defending inside it i can completely turn the situation around if i can bring yoshiyuji's forces over from izu he just recently captured it and the public order situation was actually looking pretty good so i realized i could start moving towards sagami already and once he takes sagami he'll be just one turn away from coming to help in masashi so I had to deal with a few public order problems in the area. Suruga in particular is getting a little bit uppity. So I'm using some of the guys who were reinforcing Yoshiyuji to go back and deal with that situation. Yoshiyuji himself is going to start marching on Sagami. I know from previous intelligence that, the, that Sagami has almost no troops defending it. It's very unlikely they've constructed very many since I last got that intelligence. So I feel pretty confident about marching in. I need to get some movement points back, but in one term's time, we'll be able to move in on it. Now way back over in the west, I finally decided that I would attack that Hiroshima army with Takeyuki. I wanted to get the initiative and allow myself to move back east towards the Iwakumi situation if something went bad. Of course they might even attack the castle itself, in which case I do need to move back to the castle after this. Now this army is interesting in that it actually has loads of parrot guns. This army probably has artillery parity with us or even superiority, probably the first time we've seen this. So this is going to be a different type of battle to what you we usually see. The rest of the enemy's army isn't particularly good, it's a strange mix of a melee troops, but overall the enemy could do something very dangerous with their artillery. So the battle starts, I've got my guys deployed in a nice long thin line. Across the very flat field the enemy's artillery is setting up, already taking fire from my artillery. I started by directing my parrot guns to fire at theirs, hoping to take some out, but you have to get remarkably lucky to actually destroy parrot guns uh, with artillery, because you have to get almost direct hits on the artillery pieces themselves to knock out. Even hits landing, hits landing right next to it, sorry, don't do anything as you can see right here in fact. 
So the enemy starts returning fire, and uh, right away, it's very deadly. It tears a hole in my front line, destroying this unit of carbine infantry. And you can see behind, it actually hit Takuyuki and his bodyguards. Very dangerous. If he was hit by artillery and lost, that would be a crushing blow. So I started maneuvering him around to get him out of the line of fire. These US Marines are also in the line of fire. A tragic shame for them to be killed by artillery when they're so good at line infantry battles. This artillery will just be completely wasting our forces, our best men being killed by it I realized I couldn't just stand around and let them do this initially I wanted the enemy to attack me but uh, it seems that's not going to happen the enemy was setting up a defensive position as is their right so I'm going to charge it all the way I'm going to be taking artillery fire I can only hope that my casualties are minimized especially among the US Marines so I really need to keep alive do not forget who you are Marine do not forget that the reason you sailed halfway around the world to fight is because the Republic was the best soldiers this Earth had to offer. Don't forget that the war you won at home was enough to make you all heroes, no matter what happens to you today. The Japanese might ask a lot of us, but that is only because the United States Marine Corps has a damn tall reputation as the best of the best. A reputation we're gonna build up even taller, I tell ya. Let's show these backward samurai what it really means to be a warrior. Follow me! While the exchange of artillery fire was going on, the enemy's army was forming up as well. They're setting up in a strange position off to the left from their artillery banks. I think they've decided this is the best place to defend. But of course, they're also taking shots from my artillery. So the enemy are taking some hefty casualties too, only their casualties are among less valuable units. Here you can see this squad of carbine infantry is taking extreme losses. The US Marines too just take a direct hit and they're really starting to lose men, but it's not damaging their morale because they're such an elite and well-disciplined unit that they're prepared to take extreme casualties even in these really dangerous situations now as i advance the ai does a very cunning move they fall back with their main forces this prolongs the phase of the engagement that's dominated by artillery the area where the enemy have an advantage so a very fine move from them forcing me to chase them down although of course they can only fall back as far as the position of their artillery will allow now I'm moving Takayuki up, this is kind of dangerous considering he could be taking collateral damage from the artillery fire against the main line. I've kept him pretty far back from the main line, hoping that won't happen. You can see here a direct hit kill some of his guards. I'm going to keep him back here just below the crest of this hill, hoping it will reduce the extent to which he takes fire. Still a very dangerous situation, I need to end the rule of that enemy artillery as soon as I can. The enemy army too is taking damage from artillery and now from sharpshooters. I've got close enough that my sharpshooters who have the enemy outflanked can start taking out their samurai. The enemy begin to use their forces to engage us properly now. First their hidden archers appear from in front of the line and start bombarding my guys with arrows. They're going to take losses but it's not nothing to be worried about because now they're in range and able to fire back at the archers. These guys are all leveled up and have the high accuracy bonuses from the uh, elite Owari trading grounds. So it's going to be an easy victory for these guys in a range match. Some of these archers are actually trying to walk closer. A very poor move. So with the line now generally engaging, it's time to start trying to get the battle back into our favor. The US Marines, though, are not doing too well. They've taken extreme losses. The battle hasn't even really begun. So our best troops are not in the best state. But still, they're going to be doing good work, even with limited men. The rest of the line now engaging with the enemy as they advance. The enemy has a mostly melee-based army, so they have to charge at us. And that's going to work much to our advantage because they're going to be taking that accurate fire the entire time. Here, a unit of their cavalry gets a pretty good charge against some of my line infantry. Line infantry aren't all that bad against cavalry, though, so it's not too much of a bad situation. Plus, they happen to charge right next to where one of my two units of spearmen were positioned, so we'll be able to deal with those cavalry pretty rapidly. The enemy samurai and melee troops are not having a very good time, rushing about in front of the line, some of them not even taking a direct straight path into us, rushing about at angles and routing and coming back from routing, and overall getting completely wasted as they meander in front of our firing line, who are pretty much becoming a firing squad for these enemy melee units. So the enemy are now in full retreat across much of the battlefield, plus our cavalry are now raiding to the enemy's rear. One unit now has a clear run on the enemy's artillery positions, so finally I can take them out. 
Those artillery had shifted their focus to fire at these line infantry who had come into close range to fire at their crews. So they were taking lots of fire from the artillery and from archers. They were taking the brunt of the enemy's capabilities at this point because the rest of the enemy force is in complete disarray in the center. It's pretty much all over. They just have a few disparate units who are rushing around, mixed in with my own cavalry, taking them down. My cavalry are even taking friendly fire in this situation. And my artillery is doing a good job of chasing the enemy off the field as well. It's pretty much a complete rout for these forces. The survivors aren't going to survive for long as my cavalry maraud them on the way off. So now the entire battlefield is covered in enemy bodies as you can see. The enemy's artillery crews ran away as my cavalry advanced leading to a decisive victory for Takayuki's forces. We did, of course, take fair casualties from their artillery advantage as we came across the battlefield, but as you can see from the field itself, covered in enemy bodies, the enemy took some pretty hefty casualties too, in fact, losing their entire army. So let's head back to the campaign map and see exactly what the price we paid for this victory was. So around 400 losses, the enemy losing thousands of course, many of the losses among the US Marines and some of the Carbine Infantry who are standing near them. Overall though, most of the army is still in pretty good shape, so we're still in a position where we can move on to fight another battle very soon. The Hiroshima are not, their army is wiped out, so Harima is safe from Western invasion yet again, but we still can't move west because of course the Iwakuni might come and attack Harima in its center, so we need to move Takeuki back just to guard the city. I don't think they're going to attack based on their current angle as I've said, but I'm not going to risk it either. So Takeuki is just going to wait and see what happens and of course regenerate some troops as he waits to get himself back up to full strength. Now as we move forward, the Satsuma army did move towards the capital just like the previous one did, so I'm going to have an opportunity to intercept it with my forces at Setsu. The Iwakuni don't move at all it seems, they just sit there on their little beachhead, so an interesting decision, it means we'll be able to attack them with Takeyuki very soon. The Hiroshima then sent a fleet against my raiding fleet near Kowachi. They would have had no chance at all if it wasn't for the Satsuma fleet in the background which reinforces them, meaning the balance bar is actually in their their favor but of course we've seen this situation many times I'm just gonna pull off the classic strategy of sitting in a line and taking out the enemy as they come in hopefully we'll wipe them all out what are I meant to make of these orders from father first he tells me not to advance to Tajima even though we could easily crush the rats posing as our enemy there he thinks my judgement not sound enough as if to advance now would bring disaster and not the clear advantage we have seen then he sends me these reminders that as a member of the family who instigated this revolution, people expect me to pull my weight, lead by example, put myself in harm's way to show my dedication, blah blah. So which is it to be? Does he even think about these orders before sending them? <sighs> Guess I'll do what needs to be done. The Sioux fleet led by the now infamous Colbert Compton has lined up to receive the enemy yet again. The enemy are coming in in a straight line, perfect, just like their predecessors did. It didn't work for them, so it seems unlikely it's going to work here. The enemy's trump card, their reinforcements from the Satsuma, are luckily coming in behind them rather than at an off angle which might ruin my strategy. These ships from the Satsuma are superior, they're copper plated and they're pretty decent. You can see they've brought in some frigates. Now because they're faster than the Hiroshima ships, they will catch up and join the battle at the same time as the Hiroshima ones despite the Hiroshima starting in front, which might ruin my strategy because it somewhat relies on only engaging one ship at a time, but we'll see. The first Hiroshima ship was a frigate which turned off as it came in and decided to not bother continuing advancing towards our line because a few early shots set it on fire so they stopped to repair their ship. The ones following in started turning as well but they're actually turning to engage rather than quitting the engagement. So turning in and they're focusing their guns on my ironclad just like previous invaders have done. The ironclad is going to take the brunt of the enemy's attack which in some ways is a good thing. The enemy are only using standard shot and the ironclad heavy armor will allow most of those shots to just bounce off even when they do hit so it's excellent news and of course when the enemy turns in they're just putting themselves closer and closer to my own lines who will now start bombarding them with explosive shot i'm guessing the hiroshima haven't researched explosive shot because they're not using it either that or they actually were using armor piercing shot i didn't notice either way the ironclad is managing to resist their fire even though they are firing with superior guns the frigates have bigger range and more firepower 
than the Corvettes, which make up the majority of my fleet. Still, even with their slight advantage ship to ship, it doesn't mean they have an advantage overall. Of course, these frigates who are leading the attack are being completely blasted by these explosives, and the crew on board are not particularly happy about the situation. Many of them on the deck are killed by the shrapnel and explosions themselves. The ship is on fire. The crew decide it's not worth fighting on an abandoned ship. So one of the best Hiroshima ships is lost early on. The rest of their ships are now turning in to begin their attack runs, but of course they will face similar fates. One ship in particular decided to try an alternative tactic. Instead of turning to engage us, they just continually charged our line, getting really close as you can see. Because they're charging head on, that presents only a small target to my gunners. So they managed to get pretty close, not even taking that much fire. But as they got really close to the line, almost uh, to the point where they were going to ram through our ships, they decided to surrender. I guess they realized they didn't really have a plan for what to do once they got here and decided to just give up before their entire ship was demolished. Now my ships were having the same problem I've seen previously where the ships start turning because of momentum, but this time I was actually at the keyboard, so kept turning them back to keep the line straight. The ironclad had to turn around completely because one side was taking really heavy damage to its armour, so I turned to present the other side to make sure it didn't take uh, too much damage on one side and start sinking. The remaining enemy ships follow the example of their predecessors and start surrendering as their boats are bombarded by fire and catch fire in fact leading to a decisive victory for the Sioux Navy. I guess it was expected, but it's nice to see yet another confirmation that the enemy fleet commanders are not able to deal with the simple tactic of putting the boats in a line and just sitting there and firing at them as they come in. So that's another threat dispatched anyway. Let's head back to the strategy map. The battle results, as you might expect, are going to be a little bit predictable. We destroyed all of their ships, didn't lose any of ours, did take some damage to the ironclad, which was the focus of the enemy's fire, perhaps even worth sending it back to port to repair pair but overall nothing too bad. Now the Edo forces decided to attack North Shinano with the small army they've been moving up for ages. They probably didn't realize I had a half stack hidden in the forest nearby so the balance bar is completely in my favor so I'm taking this opportunity to quickly wipe them off the map meaning North Shinano is now pretty safe and the source of these invasions Kosuke is on the verge of being invaded by Takamichi so North Shinano might finally be safe forever in the near future. We saw just there the Yonozawa forces laid siege to Echigo province. Not a very good idea from them because they only have a very small army. I was going to look at that but then I was distracted by this building sabotage message. It seems that down in Mino a ninja has managed to take out the financial district which was quite important for making Mino a profitable province and very expensive to repair. A very inconvenient move. But anyway back in, back in Echigo sorry, you can see I have this massive garrison army which is easily enough to break the siege. The enemy run away. I was wondering whether it was quite enough to go and attack them in the field with the remaining forces. The enemy have a bunch of uh, powerful samurai units and I just have sort of a holding force. The cavalry in my force might be able to take out a good number of the enemy but I decided not to bother attacking them and instead do a battle I know is definitely going to be useful and I'm definitely going to win Takemichi's assault on Kosuke. He moves in, he has a giant advantage already, the enemy had a couple of units plus a small garrison of mostly levied troops so we're going to wipe through them and take Kosuke for ourselves. Kosuke as I've mentioned isn't particularly valuable, not particularly important either, but it's just a way to expand our domain and secure more territory. It has a magistrate already, curiously, meaning that Republican fervor will be spread in the province straight away. It can also build a railway station, although the railway line only connects to Echigo and Echu at the moment, which isn't terribly useful, but in the future there might be an important reason to put a railway line sorry, going through this area heading southwards. It also gives us exposure to new enemy territory, particularly the Odawara territories. I mentioned in the past that we'd almost defeated them, but actually they do have some more territories back in northern Japan, who we'll be going up against later.
That's all for now. We'll be seeing an epic battle to defeat the Satsuma invasion and to secure the Shogunate capital next time on Teppo Republic.